I want to talk about the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, the great uh, Our Father that Jesus taught uh, His disciples and through them all of us. Because whenever we pray, the Church Father said we're doing a version really of the Our Father. It's the prayer of prayers. Here's the first thing he observes now. This is in Matthew's version in the Sermon on the Mount. In praying, do not babble like the pagans who think they'll be heard because of their many words. Now, see, the problem here is not so much the many words in themselves. The problem is the assumption that God or the gods have to be persuaded. They're like a big city boss. I've got to go over and again and ask and ask, and maybe in time I'll wear them down or I'll change their minds. The God we're dealing with here in the great Christian tradition is not a God whose mind we change. Rather, prayer changes us. It's one of the most basic things that we have to know about prayer. If we go into it with the attitude of, I'm trying to change God's mind, I'm already on a bad spiritual uh, plane. It's the prayer that changes us and brings us online with God. Now, here's how the great prayer, of course, begins. Our Father who art in heaven. That line, of course, is very evocative. Our Father, Abba, it's language of intimacy, right? closeness. God is a father to us. But who art in heaven? What's being signaled is the right understanding of God. God is that power, that reality, which can be neither grasped nor hidden from. If I can grasp God, I now start manipulating God. That's why I say he's in heaven. What's in heaven is I can't control. But I can also run away from God. I can try to. That's why I call him our father. Because in his intimacy, he can't be avoided. Now I'm in the right stance when I know that God is that which can be neither grasped nor avoided. Then I say, hallowed be thy name. Does that mean that his name isn't hallowed and that God should make it so? No, we're not trying to change God or change God's mind. What we're praying here is that we might hold God's name holy. Holy means set apart in the Old Testament. It means that God should be the highest value. It's again that idea of God being highest conduces to peace in us and among us. When together we hallow the name of God above all, peace will break out among us. When in my own heart I hallow God above all, then I become rightly ordered. So it's like the most basic thing we can ask for is, Lord, bring me online with you as the highest good. Then I say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom, very prominent word in the New Testament. There's a kingdom of this world. There's a prince of this world. The kingdom of this world is the way that we typically order things. It means according to injustice, according to hatred, according to violence, according to egotism of me against you, us against them. That's the world the cosmos in the Greek. It's the world in the negative sense. What Jesus is praying is asking us to pray is, may the kingdom that obtains in heaven, that means the right order that obtains among the angels and saints in heaven, may that order of love, nonviolence, peace, other orientation, selfless love, may that order obtain here as there. You know in the Mass when we say, May our voices be one with theirs. We're talking about the voices of the angels as they sing the praise of God. We're praying that may we be harmonized among ourselves as the angels are in heaven. Your kingdom come here as there. That's what we're praying for. Your will be done. See, the world as we know it is a place where God's will is not done. My will's done. The will of powerful people is done. May your will be done. What you want, may that happen here. So think of all the social, political, economic, cultural implications of that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a very mysterious line. The phrase there for daily bread in the Greek is ton arton ton epiousion. And that word epiousios is used only here in all of Greek literature. They found it no other place in any of the literature of the Greek world. So what does it mean? It's mysterious. It's translated daily, and there's a long history behind that translation. What it means literally, usia in Greek, means substance. Epiousion means super substantial. That's why when St. Jerome translated this in the Vulgate version, he called it panem superstantialum, super substantial bread. 
That's why, you know, for centuries, when people prayed this prayer, that's what they prayed for. Give us this day our super substantial bread. Now, food for eternal life is a way to render it, perhaps. Food of the final day, of the great day of eschatological fulfillment, yes. But, of course, as Catholics, we're very struck by this term because we talk about the Eucharist, which is indeed that bread of heaven, the bread of angels. But we talk about it being transubstantiated bread, bread whose substance has been transfigured into the substance of Jesus' body and blood. And so, indeed, super substantial bread. This is a prayer for the Mass. Give us each day your presence in the Eucharist. It's a prayer for communion with Christ. Then, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. You might say at the very heart of Jesus' teaching is forgiveness. Forgiveness. How many of our problems, personal, societal, cultural, are predicated upon the incapacity to forgive? Just think about it for a second. Go personal, now then go societal, go political. Time after time, it's because we can't muster forgiveness. Um, a few years ago, Pope John Paul visited uh, Greece, and um, there was great reaction among a lot of the Orthodox to the Pope of Rome coming. And they were burning him in effigy, and they were blocking him, you know. And they asked someone about it, and they said, well, you know, back in the 13th century, and right away, I thought, back in the 13th century, I mean, you're not, <laughs> I know terrible things were done, but we have this, this terrible memory of injustice. We can't forgive the Middle East, now all the troubled places in the world. Think of troubled families. Think of troubled societies. It's the inability to forgive. And so here we're asking, Lord, please give us this capacity to forgive. It's so central. Then lastly, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I always think the last line of the Our Father is a kind of cri de coeur, as the French say. It's a, it's a cry from the heart. Right? Deliver us from evil. There's just so many things that beset us, so many evils, physical, psychological, spiritual, interpersonal, um, geopolitical. Think of all the evils that beset us. We end the prayer with a, this cri de coeur. It's, Lord, please deliver us from evil. Can you see now why the Church Father said all prayers are versions of the Our Father? The Our Father is the matrix, it's the, it's the structuring ground of all of our prayers. That whatever you're praying for should fit in here. If it doesn't, you're not praying for a, a good thing. Um, it, Jesus didn't say, when you pray, only pray this way. He says, pray like this. In other words, let this be the model for all your prayers. So spend some time in the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel with these familiar words. Happily, almost all of us, at least Christians, have this prayer memorized. Spend some time today mulling it over and drawing out some of these implications. Mm -hmm.